All right, continuing week seven, we're going to look at chapter 12. Uh, in this uh, chapter, we're going to look uh, more into due process in terms of classification, transfers, personal injury, pers personal uh, property loss. Um, the chapter looks at cases in which inmates raise due process claims. You can look in the chapter for details on those cases. We're just going to kind of give an overview of some of the major points in the chapter. Um, they, this, these might be claims based on a loss of property. Um, some non-disciplined cases where inmates claim a loss of liberty by the actions of prison officials. Um, in terms of classification, one of the most important functions in running prisons involves uh, where the offender should serve or sentence, uh, where f offenders should be assigned. Um, and we're going to look at specially trained staff, written policies, uh, age and sex of the offender, criminal uh, sophistication, geographical concerns such as their home, location of family visits, um, special needs security problems, other factors such as court recommendations, um, availability of space and appropriate facilities, um, classification according to programs offered, medical, psychiatric, those type of things. And there's some basic rules. Uh, inmate will be sent to an institution as close to home as possible, uh, appropriate for his security level and other needs. Um, Classifications determined on various reports from a PSI, law enforcement and court reports, consideration from prior confinement periods, diagnostic reception processing. Uh, could be reclassification occurring later in the stay based on factors appear after inmates in service of sentence. Uh, in terms of external transfers, treaty procedures exist for transfer inmates between the U.S. and other countries. It requires both the holding and the receiving country agree to the offender's transfer, and the offender also has agreed to the transfer. Procedure has been upheld in federal courts against claims that criminal proceedings in the foreign country violated due process standards. Uh, the leading case uh, is Rosado versus Civilotti. In that case, Rosado and three other inmates made numerous allegations regarding the circumstances of convictions in Mexico for drug offenses. They, they challenged the Constitution in their detention by habeas corpus action. The Court of Appeals noted the U.S. Constitution only applied to the actions taken in U.S. or to actions taken by U.S. agents. Uh, Bill of Rights does not protect U.S. citizens against any actions that might be taken by foreign nations officials. Uh, a major concern in this case was the voluntariness of the prisoners' consent to be returned to the U.S. Appeals Court found the inmates' decisions were voluntarily and intelligently made. The court further recognized the desirability of having a transfer procedures available. It did not want to jeopardize the chance of other inmates to transfer out of Mexico. The court approved the concept and the legality of the international transfer process. Uh, returning inmates can challenge uh, uh, through writ of habeas corpus or 1983 action, any conditions or actions of U.S. officials after the inmates are returned to custody of the U.S. Transfer procedures have been upheld against claims by U.S. inmate that he should be returned to his native country, even though the U.S. didn't approve of the transfer. Uh, lower courts held the inmate had no entitlement to mandamus relief because the AG had total discretion to make the transfer decision within the framework of the treaty. Uh, in terms of loss of property and personal injury, Parrot v. Taylor, 1981, um, hobby materials ordered and paid for by an inmate were lost. Inmate sued under 1983. Supreme Court noted inmate claim was the property was negligently lost. Uh, the analysis would have to focus on whether the essential elements of Section 983 claims were present. Was the loss caused by a person acting under color of state law? And if yes, whether that state official's conduct deprived the inmate of right given him under the Constitution. Uh, in this case, the court found the inmate had been deprived of his property under color of law. The court then looked at the applicable constitutional provision, the due process clause, and the court found the first part of the clause was met, that there was a loss of property. However, uh, the second part of the test, uh, that he was deprived of his property without due process, was not met. The court noted the state provided a remedy to inmates who claimed a loss of property due to staff negligence, specifically uh, tort claim, and the 
the court held that the loss of property could be a basis for deprivation of constitutional rights under 1983 if the state didn't have adequate remedies to compensate the inmate for their deprivation. Uh, since state in this case did have such a procedure, there was sufficient evidence um, to dismiss the 1983 action. In Hudson v. Palmer, 1984, in addition to dealing with cell searches, it also had a due process claim. Inmate Palmer claimed the officers intentionally destroyed some of his property just to harass him. Uh, the court extended the holding in Parrott, saying that even intentional damage to property is not the basis for a constitutional claim as long as it's a state of remedy. In Daniels v. Williams, the inmate sued under Section 983 seeking damage for back and ankle injuries sustained. Uh, when he fell on the stairway at the city hall, the inmate claimed the jail officers had negligently left a pillow on the stairs causing his fall. The court said the due process clause was intended to secure inmates from abuse of power by prison officials. The court had to address the issue of whether ordinary negligence is enough uh, for a constitutional claim. The court held the word deprive in the Constitution kind of was more than a negligent act that mere claims of negligence would not support a constitutional claim under 1983. In Davidson v. Cannon, Davidson sent a note to the prison's assistant superintendent saying that he'd been treated, threatened by another inmate. The note was forwarded to a correction sergeant who failed to read the note right away and left the institution. Davidson was assaulted and injured. Davidson sued under 1983. The court held for the government and said, quote, where government official is merely negligent in causing an injury, no procedure for compensation is constitutionally required. Such behavior does not approach the sort of abuse of government conduct that the Due Process Clause was designed to prevent. Rather than abuse of power, the court noted that officials mistakenly believed the situation was not serious and that sergeants simply forgot about the note from the inmate. The inmate wanted some form of remedy, but the state didn't have uh, one for this type of injury. The court held that while it might be good to have, the Constitution does not require it in its situation. There's been no deprivation of protected interests. Uh, in terms of claims of excessive force, uh, the canon are brought or considered under the 8th Amendment. Claims of staff abuse or overreaction may be brought under the 14th or uh, 5th Amendment. If action by the staff was taken maliciously, sadistically, that would seem to show an abusive use of government power or authority which the court in Daniels and Davidson said the Due Process Clause was meant to protect against. The question then would be whether the state had an adequate compensation remedy under some claim procedure. If not, the injured inmate is left without a state remedy and would have a claim to be made under Section 1983. The Supreme Court hasn't decided that exact case.